So the, our take's a little different than a lot of the other papers that are going on today because we're not talking as much about people as we are about space. And we want to ask the question, where does monetary policy have more of a bite? In the places that we're doing relatively bad or in the places that we're doing relatively good? So in terms of the recent um, economic performance within the US or within Europe, we know there's a large amount of heterogeneity across different types of places. So Las Vegas, Nevada versus Dallas, very different economic performance during the recession. Unemployment rate in Las Vegas got up to you know 13% or so. Dallas peaked about seven and a half, eight percent you know, the same type of scenario is going on within Europe where Spain is a bit much harder than it is in, in Germany. So when we think about monetary policy, we usually think of it as a, a pretty blunt tool, okay? There's an interest rate, some sort of policy tool moving, and that kind of, that because of we're talking about um, monetary unions, by definition, that interest rate is constant across the member union, uh, the member states uh, uh, of the union. So. What we want to think about, though, is the spatial component of monetary policy also has some sort of, is the result of variation in collateral values potentially across space. The transmission of monetary policy to real activity. You've heard lots of different stories just in the, in the, in the first paper about how monetary policy affects real activity. It boosts stock prices, it boosts home prices, it kind of lowers the cost of credit, making firms uh, borrow more, putting, uh, you know, in expanding investment, which might also cause them to hire more workers. To the extent that some of those transmission from a given monetary policy action to real activity is dependent upon local collateral values, and to the extent that local collateral values differ dramatically across space, monetary policy could then have differential impact uh, uh, across, uh, across space. And I'm, I'm gonna show you this uh, through some, some data that the places where collateral values are most depressed sometimes see the least amount of response in terms of real activity to a given type of, of, of monetary policy. So um, what I'm gonna do, in the, in, what we do in the paper is two things. So I'm gonna spend almost all the, the, my time today on just the first part, which is data. I'm just gonna show you a bunch of data around the first quantitative easing. Not because I believe quantitative easing is different than other types of monetary policy, but just because we could date it exactly. And I'm gonna show you the response across different types of regions within the US to some type of collateralized lending. In this case, I'm gonna focus exclusively on refinancing again. Our, our point is this applies to much broader types of lending and much broader types of monetary policy, but I'm gonna use as a case study quantitative easing right around uh, quantitative easing in the refinancing channel. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of data about how refinancing was much stronger in parts of the economy, in parts of the US that were doing relatively stronger. And I'm gonna show you that's gonna actually uh, translate into some aspects of spending, local real activity. Then the second part of the paper, which I'm not gonna spend much time on today, is we try to write down a quantitative model that tries to put in the collateralized lending channel where there's two types of shocks in the model. One is a shock to um, call it local income, local productivity, something that makes Las Vegas doing worse than Dallas. And then there's also gonna be another type of shock, which is to collateral values. They might be causally correlated, the shock to productivity might cause house prices in, or collateral values in one place to change more than in another place, or they might be arbitrarily uncorrelated. But it's the correlation between these two shocks that is gonna determine the distributional effects of monetary policy and also the aggregate effect of a given monetary policy. So if we lower interest rates in the people, in the, the places in the country that are wanting to borrow the most or having the most demand for, for credit aren't actually able to get that credit because collateral values are low, it can make monetary policy less effective in the aggregate than it would have otherwise. So this correlation between collateral shocks and real you know, productivity shocks or some other local driver of local income is gonna be a key correlation that determines the distributional and the aggregate effects of monetary policy. So I'm not gonna spend much time talking about that today, but that's gonna be the key insight from the, from the model we write down. So from the empirical part, we use a lot of data, okay? So I'm gonna to try to measure, again, as a case study, quantitative easing, the first one, 
um, and I'm going to look at refinancing behavior, and I'm going to use data from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which actually measures Ref, uh, mortgage origination and mortgage application activity in real time. And we're using the micro data of this that is able to be accessed from within inside the Federal Reserve that could date this by day. So you could get very fine type of uh, uh, temporal response in terms of when the monetary policy, or uh, when the ref, uh, mortgage activity takes place. We're also going to use data from um, Equifax that has their credit uh, risk insight servicing a data set, which kind of merges um, credit records um, into uh, applications of, uh, with uh, mortgage uh, origination activity. So then we could actually see large amounts of information about the borrowers um, and their uh, loan to value ratios at the time of refinancing. So we're gonna, and then a bunch of other data sets uh, as well to merge in, but those are our main two. So this first picture you should see here is the solid line is uh, refinancing activity in the aggregate measured by the Mortgage uh, Brokers Association. And the dashed line is just the 30-year the mortgage rate rolling average o over time changes. And you can see right at the moment of the every picture I show you for the rest of the day, that red line is going to be the announcement of the first quantitative easing program in November of 2008. And you can see at that moment, mortgage rates fell and refinancing activity increased uh, within the US, okay, at that moment. Now, the second picture shows you the dark shaded line, how much of that mortgage activity was due to refinancing and how much of it was due to new originations. And you can see almost all of that activity that responded after the, the, the first quantitative easing was in mortgage refinancing. There wasn't a whole bunch of new home ownership buy, buying at that time. Um, it's just the refinancing of existing mortgages. And that's why we're gonna focus on refinancing in, in the paper. Now in the back of your mind, we should know what defines space as we've been, I've been talking about, it's the value of collateral that might ha the, uh, these locations are gonna have at the moment that quantitative easing takes place. So what I'm showing you here is the loan to value distribution of borrowers in five different US cities at the moment quantitative, the first quantitative easing took place. And you can see that bottom line is Las Vegas. And that red line in this picture is how many borrowers have at least 80% equity in their home at the time of quantitative easing. And at the t moment that it takes place in Las Vegas in November of 2008, only 20% of borrowers have at least um, 80% uh, how, uh, equity within their house at, at that time, where the comparable number in Philadelphia is like 70%. So you can see the type amount of borrowers at risk to be able to refinance differs dramatically across different types of, of, of cities um, at the inception of this first monetary action uh, or the folk monetary action that we're focusing on um, in, in this paper. Okay. The second thing I want to show you, not surprisingly, this is well documented, the correlation between how many borrowers are underwater on the vertical axis Okay, or at least have uh, loan to value ratios um, um, above 0.8, and the change in the unemployment rate up to 2008 November is highly correlated. The places that were hit hardest in terms of real activity measured by the unemployment rate going up were the places where the most borrowers were underwater. So there's this strong correlation between real activity, the unemployment rate, and house price declines, which are making borrowers uh, underwater in, the, in these different cities. And here's kind of pictures. I'm going to show you a few pictures like that in my remaining time, so let me set them up for you. What I've done is clumped all of the MSAs for which we have data, so think about 300 MSAs in the U.S., population weighted into quartiles based upon how many borrowers are underwater, measured by a loan-to-value ratio of 0.8 at November in 2008. The bottom line is going to include the MSAs like Las Vegas, where there are a lot of borrowers underwater. I'm going to refer to those as high loan-to-value ratio places. Okay. The top line is the lowest quartile of borrowers. These are going to play, include your Philadelphia and your Seattle's in these types of, uh, of metric. 
And at the moment that quantitative easing takes place, the first one, you see a spike in refinancing activity. They're trending very similarly before. You see a spike in refinancing activity that is much larger in the parts of the country that are doing relatively well. These are going to be these low um, loan-to-value type places. Okay? And this is in application data. So this is the moment using the high resolution um, data. You can see applications spike immediately after the announcement and differentially in the parts of the country that are doing relatively well. Okay? This is actually on origination data using our Equifax merging of credit records and mortgage data. And you can see, again, you see that increase in refinancing activity even in this data set between the high and low uh, loan-to-value ratios, but it's delayed a month or two. Why? Because it takes time between when we apply for a mortgage and when the mortgage actually closes. So you could see this is actually an origination of the mortgage, and that's kind of, even though the, loan, uh, the policy took place in November, you're seeing big effects in January and February um, because it just takes time between a, when an application turns into an origination. So what about people removing equity? This is going to be one channel for which we're going to be linking to real activity in the economy. You basically lost your job. The economy's suffering. You have some equity in your house. You basically want to refinance when interest rates go down. Tap into home equity. You might remove some of that equity that you might be able to use for, for current consumption. And you can see the amount of equity being removed from the refinancing uh, during the refinancing process in response to the quantitative easing was much bigger in the places that had equity. This is not surprising. So you could see that they tapped into their home, removed some equity during the refinancing uh, uh, process, more so than in the cash out uh, refinancing. I want to say, before I show you the next picture on spending, I just want to say we kept talking a lot about the effect of monetary policy on house values, okay, which is something you need to think about. The key thing to keep in mind is that house prices were falling a lot in all areas in, in this period. And monetary policy might have stopped the house pricing from falling a little bit more in one region than another, but it still didn't cause people to get equity in their house. Um, people in Las Vegas still had low, essentially no equity in their home in November of 2008, and the monetary policy might have stopped it from even getting less. But the, the key difference is it just didn't help put equity back into people's houses. M house prices continued to fall for the next um, you know, two and a half years um, from, from the, the, the start of the recession. Um, OK. And this is just a measure on spending. So we have one measure of local spending that we look at in, in the paper, and that's new auto purchases. And you can see between the high and low quartiles of MSAs, in terms of their spending on uh, cars, or at least their purchases of cars, they were tracking nearly identical with each other until QE. Okay? You see there's a little delay by a couple of months there, and why is that? Because by the time the origination started, <laughs> the application started, and turned to origination, it took about three months before it showed up in spending, which is exactly what we would expect um, if people were liquidity constrained and they needed to tap into their equity before they could actually increase their spending. And you could then see a pretty big difference in spending measured by new car purchases between the places that had equity in their home and the places that didn't have equity in their home at the time of the monetary policy expansion. So I got um, two more slides before I, I conclude. The first of which is, is this a common feature of all recessions? And the answer is, we don't find evidence of it. So what I'm comparing now in the paper is the 2008 recession. Each one of those dots are different MSAs about the correlation change in house price with the change in the unemployment rate. So in this recession, there was a strong relationship between unemployment growth and how much house prices changed during the recession at the MSA level. That correlation in the gray was not there in the 2001 recession. There was a very weak correlation between house price growth and unemployment changes um, at the local level during that recession. And then when we look at differential refinancing behavior across MSAs based upon, in this case, not how much equity they have in their home, just by unemployment changes, we don't see any differential response um, between 
the two regions in, in this recession. If anything, you might see a stronger response in the parts of the co uh, country with the, the higher unemployment rate in terms of refinancing propensity. So it's, again, this correlation between collateral shocks in something like unemployment that is driving the differential heterogeneity um, during this recession. So just putting a little bit of back of the num uh, envelope numbers uh, on some of this, uh, I'm out of time. As we go through and look at how much due to refinancing cash out, how much is due to um, mortgage reset. So in the paper, I didn't talk about it here. We have a whole bunch of variable rate mortgages that we look at. Um, we look at home equity lines of credit. So we look at a whole bunch of vectors of ways that households can get cash into their hand um, through the interest rate change from QE. And you could find of the total effect that uh, we find in terms of cash out and deterrent co consumption, home equity lines of credit, um, extend, uh, uh, refinancing cash out and reduction or changes in mortgage uh, payments, about 15% of it went to the bottom quartile, about 30% went to the top quartile. So you could see that the distributional effects were helping more the places that were doing relatively better than the places that were doing relatively worse. So again, this is just my, my summary side. It, it's important to understand the interaction between regional heterogeneity and monetary policy in the US, but in particular Europe as well. And we might want to think that the collateralized lending channel might have a, an effect that we need to, to, to think about. And at least during the Great Recession, that monetary policy, at least by our estimates, was exasperating regional dispersions. It was helping most the parts of the country that were doing relatively better and not helping as much the parts of the country that were doing relatively worse. And then going forward, there's a whole bunch more things that we want to think about, like who holds the assets um, and um, whether we could think about optimal policy. That's it. Uh, uh, now we're going to hear from Mark Zandi from uh, Moody's Analytics, who, as long as I've been a reporter in Washington, is someone who we turn to to help us think about the way that uh, regions of the country differ. So, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I, I can remember my first conversation with you was about, uh, was about the Mountain West, and I can remember you telling me, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I, I literally remember, it must have been 25 years ago, but I literally, well, actually you were right, I wasn't making a lot of sense. Yeah, I really wasn't making a whole lot of sense. Um, uh, let me say a few things. First, uh, I enjoy the paper very much. Uh, I think it advanced the ball on our understanding of the efficacy of monetary policy. And uh, I'm very sympathetic with your uh, two premises. One that, um, if you've got an economy with a lot of uh, different regional economies, it uh, impairs the efficacy of monetary policy, both in terms of its sensitivity of the economy to the, to the monetary policy change, but also in terms of the timing. I think that's intuitive, feels right to me. Uh, and also that um, monetary policy changes can have different regional economic consequences. That also, I think, looking at a lot of business cycles over 25 years, I think that's uh, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's very, very intuitive. I do have some observations, though. Um, first um, is that, uh, and I think you said it, and you said it in your paper, this is a case study. Uh, it's very partial equilibrium kind of analysis. And um, you focused very nicely on uh, one aspect of uh, QE monetary policy and the impact on regional economies, and that's the refinance channel and cash out uh, withdrawal. Very important channel, no, no doubt, but uh, only one of, of many. And I think to really truly understand the effect of QE, other monetary policy, on the regional economies, uh, it has to be considered uh, the, uh, more broadly. So one example of that uh, would be uh, the impact of QE lower interest rates on uh, arm readjustment. And you mentioned this in the paper, and I think you're, you're, you're right. Uh, but I think you're, you're using the wrong counterfactual. It, it, and you almost said, you said it up here, it's, you were looking at the change in uh, the uh, payments resulting from the decline in interest rates. But the real counterfactual is what would have happened if the Federal Reserve had not done that and lowered interest rates. The impact on those hard-pressed regional economies would have been much more severe. I mean, if you go back to before QE, 
the six-month LIBOR, which is the key index rate for most of the two 28 subprime arms that were readjusting at the time, was 4%. And right after QE, it was zero. And that made a huge difference in terms of those 228 uh, arms. I can remember there was a lot of concern at the time about those exploding arms and what impact they would have when they actually readjusted. And uh, the fact that they did not readjust was a huge boost to those regional economies like, like Vegas to, to California to, to Miami um, to Arizona. So uh, very, very important. Um, there's, there's other channels uh, that matter. Um, you know, lower interest rates obviously help out the banking system in lots of different ways, you know, lowering the cost of funds. That was very, very key to the very hard-pressed banking system in a lot of these regional economies. Uh, one might argue that the lower interest rates were, were quite helpful in bringing out mom-and-pop investors that ultimately came in and caused house prices to bottom out and to, to rise. Without those lower rates, those investors couldn't have come in to the degree that they did certainly not as soon as they did. Uh, and there's also a lot of second order effects. And one of the interesting things you point out is, and you spend a lot of inter uh, time on it, is um, uh, the impact of the cash outs on uh, consumption, particularly auto sales. Uh, well, the benefits of those auto sales actually go primarily to one of the hardest pressed regions of the country, and that's the industrial Midwest, which was getting hammered by uh, the collapse in the auto industry. So, you know, there was a case where uh, you know, the lower rates, uh, uh, the cash out refis helped uh, a, sec a region of the co economy that was struggling uh, to, a, to a significant degree. The other thing to consider is regional mobility, very important. So even if you're lifting the, uh, the, the stronger economies more than the weaker economies, it, because of the uh, mobility in the economy, it allows for uh, the economy to adjust much more quickly and unemployment falls uh, much more rapidly in places like like uh, Nevada and Arizona and California because the Texas economy is doing a lot better and you saw those migration flows pick up quite substantively. So even if you're l only lifting uh, the stronger, if you're, the initial effect is to lift the stronger regional economies, it also has a second order effect, which I think is, all, is very important. So, th so the bottom line is that when you consider all of these things, um, I think it, it, it doesn't, obviate the result. I think it mitigates it, though, to a significant degree. And you can actually see it in the data today. So go look, look at employment in the four stand states that got creamed in the downturn, uh, California, Arizona, Nevada, and Florida. Since the bottom of the recession, let's just use Q2-09 as the bottom. That's the national, uh, the nature of the, the national recession. Employment in those economies is up 12 percent. Employment uh, everywhere else is up 8%. Those economies have done marvelously well. Job growth in those four economies has been stronger than the rest of the nation since 2012. And by orders of magnitude, current job growth in those four economies together is 3% year over year compared to 2% for the nation. So obviously lots of other things going on, not just QE, and you're focused on QE. But uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it highlights the point that we need to think about this in a broader, more general equilibrium sense. I think that's, that's very important. Um, a couple of other observations. One uh, other observation is that um, uh, this, it, this is a case study, and it, it feels very idiosyncratic to me. So for example, uh, if I were constructing a scenario for a recession today, and the Federal Reserve does this in its stress testing uh, every year, if you look at the last Fed stress test and the scenario that generated it, it was a. It was motivated by a. Uh, it's motivated by a global downturn, a European crack up, a Chinese recession. Uh, okay, so if that is the motivation, if that's the cause of the next uh, economic recession that we we struggle with, and the Fed Federal Reserve's response to that would be to lower interest rates, then uh, that would also the the key effect of that would be to affect the value of the dollar and benefit the very same regions that are getting hit by uh, the slowdown in in global activity. So. I think uh, it, it, it depends. Uh, the, the case study is interesting, but I'm not so sure it, it translates into other types of economic shocks. It really does depend on the shock uh, in terms of trying to understand what the impact is across regions. And, and the final observation I'd make is uh, that this all may be, the, the relationships here may be changing pretty rapidly because the financial system is changing very rapidly. I mean, if I think, I think if we went through this kind of downturn 25 years ago before, 20 years ago before interstate banking, uh, the regional impacts would have been much more significant than they ultimately ended up being. Uh, this go around, we had a, a much more nationalized banking system. So when, 
when uh, IndyMac went belly up in San Diego, which was a, a very large California lender, Wells Fargo, the big national mortgage lender, could come in and, and kind of fill the void and do a lot of FHA lending. So uh, the regional impacts are much less significant. And I think they'll be much less significant in the next go around because not only is the banking system uh, now more national, but also the shadow banking system is starting to fill in the holes. And that is truly uh, national and international. And uh, that will, I think, in the future, mitigate some of the reg regional heterogeneity that would result from any change in, in monetary policy. Uh, let me end by saying a couple things about what all this means for policy. Again, let me, let me revert back to point number one. I think I'm, the paper's good, really good, and I think uh, I agree with it. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's very intuitive. So let's just take that as given, and this gets to the final point. This has policy implications. Number one policy implication is that uh, in economies that have more regional heterogeneity, uh, we need a more aggressive monetary policy. And this is uh, patently obvious in the context of uh, Europe and the European Central Bank. Their regional dispersions are much, much greater than the regional dispersions that exist in the United States. And that would have argued for a, a much more aggressive ECB uh, than even the Fed. And of course, we got just the opposite. And of course, I think that's one of the reasons why they've got, we've got such very uh, different results here. The second implication is that in an economy with regional heterogeneity, you need more fiscal stimulus and or less fiscal austerity. And I think that also is a uh, point is uh, very clear in the context, not only of our experience, but certainly of the European experience. And the fact that they uh, went, uh, went to austerity almost immediately uh, was uh, very counterproductive and much more so than it would have been here primarily in part because of the uh, uh, great d disparities in regional uh, economies uh, across Europe. Finally, uh, on policy, um, this might be more controversial, uh, I think it also argues that fiscal policy should be used to help facilitate monetary policy. And we got a good example of that in your case study, uh, opening up the credit channel for more refinancing, and that was the HARP program, the Home Affordable Refinance Program, which was first implemented in 2009, got a revamp in 20, at the end of 2011. This cleared out, cleaned out that, chan that, that channel, and actually as of today, 3.3 uh, million homeowners in those very distressed states uh, Got, uh, got uh, refinancings because no longer was CLTV a criteria for refinancing for a Fannie Freddie loan. It made a huge difference to those economies. And I think we need, the, obviously there's a lot of political economy issues with regard to the statement that fiscal policy should be used to help support monetary policy and vice versa. But I think smart fiscal and monetary policy going forward does need to think about how to work together uh, to clean out those uh, channels to allow monetary policy uh, to work more effectively in, in recessions. Thank you. So in case uh, the unfamiliar face here is Andrea Fuster from the New York Fed, who uh, worked on this paper. And uh, I'll say on his behalf that nothing he said speak has anything to do with anything that they think about at the Fed or <laughs> something like that. Isn't that the standard disclosure? Yeah. My favorite was uh, somebody from the Fed gave a paper at the IMF and said, when I use the word we, and he put up a picture of Janet Yellen, I'm not talking about her and me. <laughs> Um, so I want to pick up a little bit on the, where Mark ended, uh, Eric and Andreas, the, the kind of so what question. Mm -hmm. So monetary policy always works at, on an economy as a whole. You can't, it's kind of hard to target it mm -hmm. uh, at particular regions. So is there any lesson here for how monetary policy could have been different? And then I'll ask, I'll pick up on the fiscal in a minute. I or mean, just something that I he think, said I think basically I think do more. You got to do more. I mean, so at the end, if the p places where the people have the highest marginal propensity to consume aren't able to, 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 to borrow, and you want to stimulate aggregates. So that's your goal. You want your target is aggregate unemployment rate, or the, you might have to do more just to, to, because you're not targeting the people who have the biggest marginal propensity to consume for a given change in interest rate. So, Andreas, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay, so now 
I, I, I think you raised a good question about fiscal policy, Mark, but I would have put it differently. That um, Of course you would. If, <laughs> if you know that your monetary policy is going to work better in some regions of the country than others, then should you have should you structure your fiscal policy, your housing policy, to complement what the Fed does? Mm -hmm. In other words, should they have done more earlier on the fiscal side for the L Las Vegases? M you know, HARP took a long time to get that. There was a lot of acronyms before we got to HARP. Right. Uh, is that the lesson here, that if you have a housing bust and you know monetary policy in a world where you have fixed rate mortgages so that a lot of people just don't adjust automatically, should they have designed fiscal policy with this in mind, if we had to go through this again, would that be the right lesson? Well, target fiscal policy. Yeah, I think that is, that is the lesson. Uh, I, I would say, though, in all fairness to fiscal policy makers, it's not like they didn't understand this, and it's not like they didn't try to grapple with it. I mentioned HARP, but there right. was HAMP. There's all the things that the FHA did. There was the DASP. I mean, there was a zillion and one things that were designed to address these regional problems, uh, but. Uh, st st uh, stating these things and putting them on paper and then actually executing on them in the context of all the different parties that are involved is, and also given the complete mess in at lots of different levels, you know, in, in the servicing and uh, in the underwriting originations, I mean, a lot of different uh, moving parts here. It was, it was hard to make it work uh, well. And the one program that actually worked, in my view, well it took a little time to get it going, but at the end of the day, it was a, was a slam dunk success, was HARP. I mean, 3.3 million people, mostly in these hard-pressed areas. I mean, if you go into Nevada uh, to Florida, Arizona, California, these are mostly, because they were, they were underwater. You could see, you could see Eric's uh, data, they were underwater. And by the way, I, I live in Philadelphia. Yeah. I don't feel like I had a whole lot of equity. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Should have bought earlier. <laughs> I wish I had a home in, <laughs> in Las Vegas right now. Um, but uh, There's some I think on the market. Yeah, yeah. Well, much less so than there used to be. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think the HARP program worked exceptionally well. Um, but that, that's one of the, you know, the last, the third, the third thing I said about using fiscal policy to help monetary policy. Of course, uh, uh, you have to have a, a very uh, prolonged, attenuated ec economic problem, and you know, like a Great Recession to give you the time to be able to do something like it. And a more typical kind of economic downturn, that doesn't work all, all that so, well. But I mean, fiscal policy in general does have regional components built into it automatically. So, um, you know, we could talk about HARP, you know, in, in, you know, having some effect because it was treating people underwater and it did have more effect in, in some of the stand states than others. But the key thing is unemployment benefit extensions and um, you know food stamps and all of those things are set to act in when places are people are out of a job or don't meet some asset limit and those are s automatically set up. So fiscal policy is built in to do some of this automatically. Is, we could always just cut a check to people in Las Vegas, and there's different ways we could cut a check to people in Las Vegas. Some of it is bailing them out if they're underwater. Some of it is extending unemployment benefits, Actually, and that's kind I, of it. I, in the case of Harper, I don't consider that to be a bailout at all, right? Because yeah. this was a Fannie to Fannie, a Freddie to Freddie, uh, you know, transaction, and actually it made Fannie and Freddie better off because it reduces their credit risk. So that that was not. But a it comes at a subsidy to other people that are being backed up at you know some taxpayer do dollars. So there is some in the back background. Some of this is going on. Well, I thought the loser was the person who held the. The, the Fanny, investor, Freddy, paper, exactly, the investor. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or well, well, to I the mean, extent that we're subsidizing, they expected those. I mean, right, from right, their right, expectations, yeah. they expected prepays. They right. didn't get prepays because they were underwater. Right. Right. So, so hard just, for them. Yeah, right. 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 So, so what about, can I kind of maybe add for, uh, to HARP? So slam dunk. You know, it, it happened sort of late, right? It happened 2012 is when it really took off. Uh, secondly, non-agency borrowers were not helped by the program. So subprime, all day borrowers that were, you know, very prevalent in in, in Vegas. They could not refinance under that program. So if you compare it to a world in which we had adjustable rate mortgages or mortgages that, you know, ratchet downwards where you don't have to re-underwrite the loan, I, I think that even with HARP, the transmission was, was quite a bit weaker. What about the Europe? Do, do you draw parallels? Mark made some observations about Europe. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, when you start thinking now, and so there's two things about the Europe. The, the, the dispersion is bigger, so we can know the, the Spanish versus the Germans are bigger than you know, Dallas versus Las Vegas. Um, but at the same time, they don't have an integrated fiscal system. 
So some of the automatic stabilizers we have built into our system um, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. So when we're thinking about monetary policy as being, you know, kind of the tool of the, the, the European Union, um, if it has distribu distributional effects, if there's big bis values and collateral value, you don't have anything in the background to come in and, and offset that through automatic. And that's why you're seeing now, you gotta cut checks, and the Germans gotta vote every time they wanna cut a check to people in Greece, um, as where, well into the US, it's kind of just built in to the political process that you know, Las Vegas got more checks than Dallas. So a question in the back <coughs> there, and then John <coughs> Sablehaus. Uh, good morning, uh, Tom Pally from the AFL-CIO. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. I I'd like to uh, try and roll the question back a little to something that jo uh, Josh asked and <coughs> make the connection. Uh, we know that contraction, uh, contractionary macroeconomic policy is essentially inegalitarian, and expansionary monetary po oh, expansionary macro policy is egalitarian. It makes sense. You know, you're going to be improving the labor market, it's good for wages, good for jobs, and you're, if you're doing interest rates, who owns capital? Interest rates is a sort of a payment between groups. Mm. But the question then to is, could we have done better? And Josh kicked it off by saying monetary policy versus fiscal policy. I think, since we're talking QE, and we want to draw some implications for future policy, let's try and pull it back to monetary policy versus another form of monetary, alternative monetary policies. And then, of course, Josh started saying something, he said, he said sending, let's try and get to the policy implications and how we might improve future performance and make monetary policy more egalitarian even if it's pushing in the right direction, can we make it even better? And so here, Josh started with the idea of giving the Fed somehow or other uh, uh, the power to send people checks directly. I, I think that's probably, uh, would be a good way of doing things, is address di directly these things. If you think that monetary policy is some form of transfer of funds between groups, this goes to everybody getting it, and the Fed can draw it back again if it w ever wants to pull liquidity out of the system, it can use its existing powers to raise interest rates and get people to redeposit their funds with the... Uh, but do you see any line then between fiscal, fiscal and monetary yeah, exactly. policy? Isn't that Absolutely. just fiscal policy? Fisc fiscal yeah. policy is about uh, buying resources. That's traditionally how we've see seen it, government spending. But anyway, let me just, I just want to make a list of things that might do that one you might question. Short but I want to make list. some others. The c other thing is refi directly. I mean, uh, Mark talked about HARP, uh, anyone who's re th this QE could, in terms of the housing market could have been so much more effective had people just been able to jump, if we could set up some mechanisms to jump through the process so that you get direct access if you want it. I mean, I refinanced a couple of times uh, and I every time I had to pay $1,800 in mortgage insurance. By the way, I'd like to put that on the bookings agenda. Can we do something about this question of always having to pay for fantastic mortgage insurance? I can't believe it's actuarially fair They're on defaults on property rights and so on. That's the justification every bank will always tell you. It's a fantastic fixed cost to, to, to refinancing. That's a policy consideration if we could really get okay, to Okay, one more on your list. Otherwise, we won't have any time for anybody something to respond. Something I've advocated for a very long time is something called asset-based reserve requirements. So, for instance, you could, and a mortgage fix, f fits that di very directly, you can have different reserve requirements uh, based on the uh, state of housing markets. You could say new mortgages in Nevada versus new mortgages in, in New York. Very applicable, by the way, to Europe right now if they had some sort of asset-based uh, reserve requirement scheme. Finally, we could, how about bringing back margin requirements, looking to the future? One of the things that's driving monetary policy now has been uh, is fears of an asset bubble. Well, let's not torpedo the economy with higher rates that might affect investment, the exchange rate, and housing. And if we are worried about uh, an asset bubble, the Fed should be getting back into the business right. of adjusting margin requirements. Right, no, uh, there's no. a set of that's right, but that's, that's, a, that's a separate ca conversation. You want to respond to? I mean, I have lots of thoughts, that? but the, the the key thing when we're thinking about, um, you know, the kind of the point of our paper is we got to think about the channels uh, of which monetary policy is taking place, and some of those have regional components to them, and, so, and some do not. Mark touched on uh, a little bit on this. The strength of the banking sector, to the extent that the U.S. banking system is mostly national now, doesn't have much of a regional component, except to the extent 
that people are willing to extend credit. So if we prop up banks by having asset limit limits of ex ante, and we still have booms and busts in local housing prices, the fact that when Fed lowers interest rates and they are making a decision about whether to make a loan based upon local collateral values, you're still going to have regional distribution w well on top of that. Hey, I, I, a lot of interesting ideas and, you know, obviously a lot of negatives and positives you have to iron out. But the one thing you didn't quite mention, which I think would be very useful in the context of future crises and uh, recessions, would be countercyclical capital standards, right? You know, right now they're, they're pretty much set through the cycle. And in fact, one could argue, given the way they are implemented and likely to be implemented in the future through the stress testing process, they could very well be pro-cyclical, and that is exactly the wrong way you want to do it. So you would want to set up a system where the, you have capital standards set counter-cyclically. And some, some countries effectively are doing this. So if you go look at macroprudential responses to how, potential housing bubbles in New Zealand or Australia or Canada or even in the UK, they're taking this counter-cyclical stance. It, but, and I don't, think that's the approach we Don't we have counter-cyclical capital buffers in Dodd-Frank? We see whether the Fed will use okay. them. Okay, we'll, we'll see how this works, but right. my gut tells me. Basel three. Basel yeah, but right. we'll, see, we'll see how this is actually well, implemented. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, John Sablehouse. Thanks. I'm John Sablehouse from the Fed, so anything I say should not be held against them. Uh, but and I think this is a question anyway. It's for Eric. Uh, and so what your diff and diff analysis showed us was the lack of a positive effect in the sort of low LTV uh, or high LTV regions. I'm wondering is if the same analysis could be used to show the absence of a continued negative trend in the same area. So uh, in particular, looking at defaults and new defaults that were happening. So was there anything around that time, if we, were, if we drew the same sort of pictures, we would see much higher default uh, initiations in these high LTV regions? And did that suddenly change right around the time of QE? And is that an, an avenue that we could uh, sort of add to the ledger on the other side? Yeah, so to be, to be clear, everything that picks out, nothing's about levels. So everything's only about differences. That's kind of the, the design of these regional things. Anything that's general equilibrium in general could push everybody up or push everybody down, and this is only differential. So you should think about it as not these regions are not helped at all. It's just that they're helped relatively less than the good regions. So that's the, the first thing. When you look at things like defaults or house price changes or things that we've looked at, some, some of those, you don't see much differential response. And if anything, the betterness, when you kind of have to squint a little, looks like the better regions are having less house price decline. And part of this is, <clears throat> you know, the, the bad regions were overvalued to begin with. So we keep, we keep wanting to talk about propping up house prices. We're just affecting the trend back to, to equilibrium. Sometimes that trend could go fast. Sometimes that trend could go slow. So we know these bad regions were going down much more than the good regions just because they were much more overvalued. And you still see that. Now, when you try to look, did it slow down the trend or not, we couldn't see much avenue of differential effect between defaults? in defaults. Yeah, yeah you don't, so at the regional mm, level, yeah. you don't see very much. There's micro studies that show that you know, when the payment uh, is lowered, the default propensity falls substantially. Mm. Uh, sort of on impact. So, so we look channel, at that. Yeah. See, so we have that in the payment reset in our things, and it right. doesn't look that much differential between this, the, the two regions. Again, it could have aggregate effects, but we're only picking out the relative effects. And you don't see anything else adding up in the relative effects um, between, between these two, these two um, the high and the, re uh, the low regions. All right. Great. Uh, let's stop here. We can revisit this later. We're going to take a break. I'm going to try and hold it to about five minutes so we can get close to being back on schedule. Uh, there's coffee and some pastries out here in the lobby. Uh, thank you guys very much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you.